few weeks ago, I finished the first volume of this autobiography project, exploring my aviation art career. Because of the narrow theme, I found it relatively easy to plan and execute. However, I'm sensing this second volume, which is to document the rest of my art career and my remaining body of work, will be a little more organizationally complex. Nevertheless, I've decided to start, even though I don't seem to have a clear plan as to how I will proceed. In a way, it might be a bit like beginning a painting and just hoping intuition will somehow lead me to a successful product. My only clear criterion is to try to avoid repeating thoughts I've already expressed in Volume 1, if at all possible. I've already talked a little about from what springs I think my artistic motivations may bubble, but I did neglect to explain one source. His name was John Nagy, an American who pioneered television art instruction in the 50s and 60s. Although I can't pinpoint the exact era, I think it was around the age of 11 or 12 that I became hooked on his after-school program called Learn to Draw with John Nagy. I still vividly remember endeavoring to master the techniques and media which his show introduced to me, and using his mail-order book and drawing media, which I believe are still marketed today. And much later, as an intermediate division art teacher for 28 years, certainly some of what I taught to almost 9,000 early teens related directly to what I learned from John. I may owe him more than any other instructor or professor I've studied with over the years. Now, because of my restless curiosity and the ease with which I can become bored, my art is what I consider uncommonly wide-ranging much of which I produce not fitting easily into everyone's classification of art. And at various times, I have found myself working in different media and techniques simultaneously. Furthermore, over the years, I have taken a few well-earned sabbaticals from drawing and painting to pursue other quite disparate interests. These are some of the reasons I may find organizing this part of the project a bit problematic. As I have reported elsewhere, I spent my five high school years without any art education, although I was producing a little personal art at the time. Thank goodness I didn't require a portfolio when entering Ontario College of Art in Toronto. I want to begin by making brief reference to some of the work in my collection which I produced during my time as an art student at Ontario College of Art and then at the University of Western Ontario. When I attended in the 60s and 70s, schools at this level often espoused at least some of the ideas and ideals of the previous generation, who of course happened to make up the bulk of staff. As a result, I received, admittedly among a broad range of other things, a grounding in classical representational art techniques, much of it based on drawing from observation, including the clothed and unclothed human figure. No surprise then that in the early years I considered myself a draftsman, and it was large drawings which my first solo exhibition showcased. And I still vividly remember my first life class with a nude model. I think it was on the first day of classes at OCA. It's one of those moments seared into my long-term memory. I'm sure the whole class felt as embarrassed as I when the model dropped her robe and took her first pose. I wanted to look anywhere but at her. Luckily for me, I have some innate ability in this area, and I was rarely disappointed with my life drawings. Of course, OCA introduced me to other media and techniques, but it's still the drawing courses which I remember with most fondness. My favorite drawing instructor at UWO was Roly Fenwick, who always cleverly and thoughtfully stretched his students. I admired him a great deal and was lucky enough to take more than one course under his tutelage. I still have some of the drawing I accomplished under Roly in my collection. By the way, I'm 
happy to report at this moment, Rowley is still successfully working as an artist and living in London. Nice to know he's still out there. I do value my studio courses at OCA and Western and feel I produced some worthwhile work over the years I spent there. But beyond drawing, I think I brought very little from those two schools into my own body of work. In the summer of 1969, after my second year of teaching academic subjects, I set off for Toronto in my first summer school course, representing the second of three I required to receive my art specialist qualification. I had just accepted the art position at two senior elementary schools in Stratford beginning that fall. This was the situation I had hoped for when I entered teaching. At this course, I was exposed to my first experience with clay. Under the instruction of a young and refreshingly earthy professional potter named Ralph, it didn't take long to discover that Clay and I got along pretty well together. By the end of these five weeks, I had produced what seemed to me some surprisingly sophisticated stoneware, and was already thinking about how I could continue this sort of work when I arrived home. Finding this excitement tough to suppress, during the remaining weeks of the summer, I drew up plans for a potter's kick wheel, which I built early that fall. I used and taught on that wheel for several years. Luckily for me, my newly minted potter's wheel became the basis for what turned out to be a very important partnership with the well-established Stratford artist, Bob Eerig. Bob offered to share his spacious third-story downtown studio, and soon I was happily working there, stretching my approach to clay. Together, we purchased and installed a kiln, and eventually ran adult clay classes, also taking on some shared clay commissions. It was an exciting time for me. Then, in my mid-twenties, meeting and working beside not only Bob, but other artists who seemed to show up regularly at the studio. I was beginning to feel as if I had set out in the right direction. But in 1973, I moved out of Bob's studio when Jay and I designed and built our first house in the country south of Stratford at Fairview Corner. It included a well-equipped clay studio and for the next few years, under the name Fairview Pottery, I more or less lived and breathed clay, originating some of my own glazes as well. Besides art in the park, I showed as often as I could. Mm -hmm. 
And we also participated in a cooperative gallery in Stratford, Gallery 96. During the clay years, I made mostly functional as well as sculpture and art and mixed media pieces. Eventually though, my interests led me down a different path and I gave up clay. This obviously had something to do with the fact that I was teaching clay on an annual basis to about 300 grade 7 students, handling about a ton of clay a year. It was plainly a case of clay exhaustion, I guess. A few years later, I returned briefly to clay, making several stoneware pots for my bonsai work. In fact, I still have my hand clay tools and admit to an occasional casual thought about revisiting the clay years. Early in the clay years I became interested in making jewelry. After reading a book I borrowed from the library, I began making strictly costume pieces from non-precious materials, including wire of various metals, clay beads I manufactured myself, copper tubing, and leather, influenced partly by Celtic curving motifs. Somehow I felt the jewelry I made seemed to mesh with the times. Remember, this was the tail end of the love and peace 60s. Earthy and simple were still in among a certain crowd. I recall making mainly neckwear such as chokers and necklaces and enjoyed my jewelry making while it lasted. On the other hand, my little leather fetish began when I was fairly young, maybe 10 or 11. My dad, then a traveling sales rep, gave me an old leather briefcase. I think the fastener had busted. I promptly chopped it up and made a gun belt and holster for my favorite toy six-shooter. And that was the beginning of a long and rewarding relationship with leather, which still services periodically to this day. My search for raw material led me to Quigley's, an old leather parts factory in London full of belt-driven machinery no longer in use. Instead, there were endless tables piled high with leather of all weights and colors. Mostly, I suppose, ends of tanners, lines, and seconds, but a definite gold mine for a leather crafter. They sold leather by weight and at very reasonable prices. And also findings like buckles, thread, rivets, and hand tools. I visited regularly during most of the 70s. Simultaneously with my clay production, I produced a fair amount of leather work like belts, knife sheaths, soft luggage, handbags, and watch bands. And also with the guidance of a book written by an Australian whip maker, which my wife gifted me at Christmas in 1974, Using traditional methods, I learned to make whips, which, I must say, ended up being a definite challenge. As much mathematics as craft. But my greatest leather fulfillment came in designing and creating, or recreating, leather garments, which I fashioned both for me and for Jay. Mostly jackets. In fact, I still work with leather off and on and have currently just finished remaking a coat, which I no longer wore, into a new jacket. A very complicated project. It took a whole week of effort, but I find this sort of work very personal.
I'm not really sure how I managed to create such a large body of clay work when there were apparently so many creative side trips I took during that time. Probably more than one of those involved responding to my inner child, but I definitely know that's why I took up kite making. One of the memories I carry from my early youth was my total inability to create a kite that would actually fly. I am aware that some artists consider kites as an art form, but in this case, I, I was at least as interested in aerodynamic principles as in kiting as art. During my kiting time, I created everything from ultralight tissue and bamboo butterfly kites to several major examples which included a large double-sailed roller, a big sewn multi-celled kite with a drogue, and a man-size eddy bow kite, which, by the way, I just recovered when I discovered the original paper cover had rotted over the 30-plus years since I built the original. In my experience, uh, the planning and building part of kiting is, in a way, even more rewarding than the actual flying. In a way, I consider the high point of my kiting career the design and manufacture of the kite reel I built, which allowed me more control over the heavy lifters like the multi-cell and the eddy bow. However, into every kiter's life comes a little disaster, too. I built a large polyethylene kite called a flat multi-flare, which turned out to be such a very efficient lifter that on a day when I misjudged the wind strength, it snapped its 100-pound test monofilament line. I had to watch helplessly as it sailed up and away. The last time I saw it was as it disappeared high over the forest below our house. I didn't even attempt a rescue, and I never did get a photograph of it. I found my preoccupation with kites proved to be entirely challenging and almost always pleasurable. Each one I built demanded problem solving, intuition, and invention, and in its own way became a vehicle for practical creativity. During the 70s, besides working with clay and following various other minor creative paths, I did create a few individual paintings as well, both in oils and in acrylic. But toward the end of the decade, I made a conscious and, to me, binding decision. Would I simply continue to treat art as just a fun pastime, a serious hobby? Or would I endeavor to create some sort of career as a working artist? I chose the latter. While I carefully considered what direction I wanted to take that career, I'd, I decided to give myself a short-term goal, a project of sorts. It was the teacher in me. As I considered myself a draftsman, I decided to work on a series of pen and ink drawings on animal themes, and then to reproduce some as limited edition prints. This project included drawings which became a four-print series, including a screech owl, a red fox, a Nubian goat, and a cottontail rabbit. It was my first project with Dave Carter, a former student, and the Beacon Herald Fine Printing Division. It would certainly not be the last. My consideration of a more major career direction received a serendipitous assist when, on a PA day, I accompanied some secondary art teachers on a trip to Beale Tech, a high school in London noted for its excellent art program. It was probably the best in the province, possibly in the country. I still vividly recall my excitement that evening as I told Jay what I had seen at Beale. Senior students were working painting almost, with powdered graphite in very large-scale drawings. As a draftsman, I understood the personal possibilities this presented, and I was very motivated to begin. Immediately, I embarked on a series of large powdered graphite drawings, much larger than drawings I had done before, about 22 by 29 inches, exploring various themes including landscape, the human figure, animals, and royalty.
Soon, through our involvement with Cooperative Gallery 96, I was offered my first solo exhibition, which I was to call Recent Drawings, including my new series of powdered graphite works, as well as a few other reasonably current drawings. This show occurred in May of 1981. Although only moderate in its commercial success, my first show led to more large-scale drawings, several of which were sold over the next few years. I also decided to send one of these drawings, Walking to Work, as a wedding gift to Prince Charles and Lady Diana. This proved to be a bit of an adventure, and the package was hand-delivered by a Canadian diplomatic courier to Buckingham Palace. In a quiet moment now and then, I often wonder whatever happened to walking to work. Also after this show, I began experimenting with adding limited subtle color to some subsequent large drawing. Over the years, I have continued to use this technique for drawing, especially for aviation themes and larger works, and have never improved on this technique. After my first solo show, Recent Drawings, I soon began to look for something fresh, a different method of working I could again get excited about. I soon bumped into a technique which truly appealed to my sense of adventure, and that it seemed poles apart from powdered graphite caught my attention as well. As it happened, I knew I was ready to paint. Drawing did have some limitations under which I had begun to chafe, this new way of working employed mixed water-based media, including inks, as well as water-based paint, such as watercolor, gouache, and acrylic. And although it would probably have worked on primed board, the ground was watercolor paper. The subject appealed to me as well, land and waterscape, most often combined. I found whereas powdered graphite was all about control, this technique was more about experimenting, daring to be a bit out of control, always a bit over the top. And the results definitely moved my work well toward abstraction. The idea was to create images filled with textures created by applying various materials to very wet surfaces while they were drawing. The only criterion was that these materials make good contact with the drawing paints and ink and be able to be removed cleanly at the end. The texture making materials were more or less limitless, pieces of plastic, mesh, fruit bags, crumpled or creased wax paper, salt, coarse cloth, food wrap, whatever would not embed itself into the drawing liquid media. 
Speed of working was of the essence. Some areas of very liquid, often poured, media were covered with texture-making materials and weighted down. Drying time could be a few hours to a few days. When dry, the unveiling was always stimulating and often serendipitous. One could never predict with certainty what the results would be. Often the outcome was more interesting than even hoped for. This colorful, textured image could then be developed with additional glazes of color and possibly drawn into with steel, straight pen, and ink. Images attained various levels of abstraction, and so titling a work became more of a challenge than I had been used to. In fact, it wasn't until much of this work had been completed in 1986 that Jay and I actually began to formally photograph, record the title, size, and media of each of my works. So, unfortunately, many titles from this period have disappeared into the mists of time. My final show at Gallery 96 in 1985 was based on this period of work and exhibited under the title Shorelines. Each painting referred to where the water meets the land. Shorelines represented my first real commercial success and it was satisfying to see several of the works from this show find new homes. I can't think what other technique has given me more fun and enjoyment over the years. This is one approach I have revisited every once in a while, and always with excitement and great pleasure. In this case, it is just as they say, a change is as good as a rest.
between shows at Gallery 96 during 1984 and 5, I completely stepped away from drawing and painting. I had begun reading about the Royal Canadian Navy and especially the role it played during World War II. Now, it had been a long time since my model building days in my early teens, but for some reason I wanted to express this interest by scratch building a ship model. I'm not sure how I made the choice, but I had soon decided to model the Canadian tribal class destroyer HMCS Haida. For its time, a cutting edge ship which was the size of and carried armament more suited to a small cruiser. The Haida, one of 27 of the class, was constructed in Britain and served during the war in the Arctic, the English Channel, at Normandy, and in the Bay of Biscay. It also took part in the Korean War. She was in active service in the RCN until 1963. I already knew a bit about the Haida and had visited the ship at her mooring at Ontario Place. My family and I watched the CNE air show from her flying bridge, a memorable experience. I was especially impressed with her size and fighting record. So, as the only remaining tribal in the world, I felt she represented a good candidate for modeling. Although a plastic kit may well have been available, that idea didn't excite me. I wanted to try my hand at scratch building. It turned out to be no small task, although I remember enjoying every second of the work. I researched information about the tribals in my own library and set out to create her from wood, plastics, and found materials of all sorts. When it came to her guns, I had to invent a miniature lathe powered by an old quarter-inch drill in which I could turn the barrels from wood. I made turning tools from little screwdrivers, and, considering the size of some of the smaller guns, it worked very well. There was a lot of hand carving as well, and I remember her twin screws proved most difficult. My model of the Haida would not be considered museum quality. It simply illustrates the flavor and sense of the real ship. Nor is it period specific. That doesn't mean I'm not proud of it. I am. While my modeling juices were still running strong, I looked for another Canadian vessel to commemorate. HMCS Sackville, a Canadian flower-class corvette, seemed a good nominee. Along with the Haida, the Sackville was the only other Canadian World War II ship extant. It was moored without an engine in Halifax Harbour as a museum ship. By this time, though, someone had pointed out to me that a government service existed for modelers. I acquired a catalog and ordered several plans having to do with the type for a very moderate fee. Because of the cost, I had envisioned these to be of the 8.5 by 11 category. But the day the mailman turned into our place with a tube sticking out of his back window, that vision was proven very wrong indeed. To build my sackful then, I was able to use actual declassified shipyard blueprints, so outsized I couldn't roll them out completely in my large studio. That's the way the government spends our money. So I can safely say my Corvette model is much more accurate than my tribal. By this time, my modeling technique was more advanced as well. The Sackville is what is referred to as a waterline model, and in a way, the water is the pièce de résistance. It was made by carving a block of styrofoam with a wire loop attached to an electric soldering iron, and then painting the result with acrylic. I say with uncharacteristic immodesty, it is about the best representation of water I've seen in my vast experience in the scratch-built modeling world. In all, I exclusively spent 18 months making these two ship models. Almost 25 years later, I set about to remake the cases in which they are kept. These models are now on display in our home, at least in part as a memorial to all those who served during World War II in the Royal Canadian Navy. The summer of 1989 represents the major watershed of my art career. 
That summer, I created my first aviation painting, and from that moment almost to this, I admit to feeling somewhat bipolar. My attention has generally been divided, although not always equally or exclusively, between the two genres, aviation and landscape. I know many have wondered how I could pursue two such disparate themes. There are no easy answers. All I know is that I have flourished under this apparent contrasting duality. In the simplest terms, uh, when I began to feel exhausted in one genre, I would again pursue the other with renewed energy. It has always worked well and has served to keep me fresh and engaged. Elsewhere in this autobiography project, I have documented my aviation art career in detail. So, with no other overarching plan, I've decided to divide my remaining work into two decades, mostly allowing the paintings to speak for themselves just as they were meant to. So now, uh, I'll look at some of the work I have produced during the 90s. Most people think there must be something quite strange about a guy who is attracted to making whips and knives, right? What can I say? My knife making started with a book I found at the library. I just said, I can do that, and decided to prove it. So I bought some O1 tool steel and some brass at a local machine shop and began to design and make some knives. Soon, of course, I found out it wasn't going to be quite that easy. The design part proved reasonably simple, but I found the hand machining of the steel into acceptable blades to be a different story, representing a very steep skill learning curve. I had to learn to grind, weld, and polish, and of these skills, hand grinding proved to be by far the most difficult. I actually manufactured a motor-mounted grinding drum of the correct diameter for the hollow grinding, but often my excuse to myself was that I couldn't afford the expensive pro-level power tool to do the job well. After all, 
I just wanted to make a few knives. However, in the end, I was able to do just that. But after a great deal of effort on the first few knives, I ran into a tall speed bump when some of those roughed out blades were warped in the heat treating process by a company in Kitchener. To my intense disappointment, this meant I couldn't complete them. Although that incident definitely took some of the steam out, nonetheless, I have succeeded in finishing some reasonable knives of which I can be proud. Over the years, I've tried making knives in various ways, including using commercially prepared blades, remaking existing knives, and creating blades from old files, employing a process called cold grinding, thus avoiding subsequent heat treatment. In addition, of course, I was able to employ my leatherworking skills to create sheaths as well. And to this day, I always feel a definite sense of accomplishment upon completing a functional knife, whether from scratch or using some other method. I retired from teaching after 30 years in the classroom at the end of the school year 1996-7 to help Jay run our gallery and attempt to earn a living as a full-time artist. It would be five years before I finally had access to my teacher's pension funds. I was certainly concerned about maintaining our lifestyle. It was a gamble to be sure. That fall, at an after-dinner presentation I provided for a local service club, I was approached by Vic Hader, a local millionaire entrepreneur, previously unknown to me, uh, about painting what he referred to as a mural on the storefront signage area of a large building he was constructing in downtown Stratford, called Stratford Place. His idea was to create this work in situ, in other words, painted on a scaffold out of doors. I politely told him this didn't appeal to me as a possible project because I didn't work outdoors, but I told him I would think about an alternative plan which would mesh better with my way of working. Eventually I accepted the commission which, when complete, consisted of 23 original paintings I would paint in my studio and then apply to the sign space. His wish was that these paintings be about Stratford, both past and present. It was a theme which interested me and would provide enough variety to keep me well engaged over the year I told him would be required to complete the work. He asked for an educated guess as to how long the works would last fully exposed to the elements. I estimated that would be about a decade, which seemed to satisfy him. But Fourteen years later, I'm happy to say they still look pretty good. And so I began. The paintings of current Stratford would be in full color, while the historic images would be painted in a sepia scheme. The ground was sign painter's plywood with a paper-like skin of medium density fiberboard, thoroughly primed and sealed. The medium was acrylic, supplemented by the highest quality exterior latex I could buy. Having provided Vic with a detailed plan, I set about researching and gathering the resources I would need. As the project unfolded, each painting had to be finished in an average time of two weeks. Vic was in a bit of a rush. So over the next 11 months, I was pretty much literally chained to my easel. I painted in small multiples to fit each signage space and installed the works in batches as they were completed. The Stratford Beacon Herald newspaper provided major coverage for each group as they were installed. This project engendered quite a stir in the city, I think in the main because of the newspaper coverage and that these were images to which many Stratfordites could easily relate. This project still represents the most major effort in such a very concentrated time frame which I have ever achieved. It also represented a full year's salary as well, something that came in quite handy at the time.
Having planned our move north, we decided to do one last annual show at our Gallery 164. For this exhibition, I decided to paint a series of acrylic landscapes, some of them in reasonably large scale. When I was nine years old, I watched with some interest as my parents designed a simple ranch-style house on a sheet of writing paper in one afternoon. And I, I remember being well aware of the satisfaction they experienced seeing their dream come to life as the house was actually built. I'm taking for granted this is, in part, why I have always felt much more fulfilled living in a home I have designed myself. Jay and I have been fortunate enough to undertake this experience more than once, and I plan to cover this topic in more depth elsewhere in this project. I had very little drafting experience when, in 1972, we began to draw plans for our first home. Our builder, Don McLeod, was able to work from two fairly simple plan view drawings and two or three additional detail plans. For this first house, instead of endeavoring to master the concept of elevation drawings, I chose to create a quarter-inch scale model which helped us build our first home at Fairview, south of Stratford. Fast forward 13 years, and we found ourselves designing yet another home, this time to be built in Stratford itself. Because there was a more stringent vetting process to go through in the city, I gave myself a crash course upgrading my drafting skill to a much higher functional level. As a result, I was able to create the 13 or so major drawings required before the city would give us the go-ahead for this residence project. But then, by the end of the 80s, Jay and I had made the decision to establish a retail gallery business. To accomplish this, we purchased a three-story Victorian home on the edge of Stratford's business section, which had most recently been a quadruplex. Again, my drafting skills allowed me to draw up plans for the major renovations, which would turn this tired, run-down tenant house back into a quality, single-family residence with business space on the first floor, which became our Gallery 164. But ten years later, we had decided to abandon our commercial open-door gallery and build a so-called retirement home in Stratford, from which we could continue operating as a home-based art business. We spent three months dreaming and drawing the plans for a specific lot we had spoken for from a local developer only to find one fateful weekend that someone else's house was taking shape on what we had thought would be our property. Although we obviously considered this to be an unfortunate turn of events, it eventually led to our move to Wasaga Beach in the fall of 1999, to a pre-built home this time, 
And, to our lasting regret, this left our most recent house plans unrealized. Nonetheless, Jay and I seemed to thrive on these residential projects, and if the chance presented itself yet another time, I know we would not hesitate to do it all over again. I guess I really am a frustrated architect, but I am grateful to have had more than one chance to create a residence from scratch and to have the experience of living in these homes, almost as if living in a big piece of personal sculpture. Over the years, I have had several opportunities to exercise my ability to represent specific individuals in drawings and paintings, and, unfortunately, sometimes under rather negative circumstances. I freely admit, of all subjects and themes, I find portraiture to be most demanding. Capturing the appearance of a real person and then endowing it with a bit of the spark of life is challenging indeed. Some portraits were created as companion pieces for major aviation works. One portrait commissioned by his son was that of a career Air Force pilot who was dying of cancer. I very much enjoyed creating my double portrait of actors Martha Henry and Bill Hutt for the Stratford Place project of 1998. My most emotional portrait project proved to be the commemorative painting of a personal friend and teaching colleague, Kathy Jackson, who had been brutally murdered by her jealous husband. One double portrait of Prince Charles and Lady Diana, prefaced by a drawing done years before, which I now consider a separate work, was painted in response to Diana's sudden and violent death. And my painting, Once Upon a Time, was eventually included in a comprehensive book called Diana in Art. In a way, my favorite portrait, after a 1945 photo which he kept on his dresser for his whole adult life, is that of a very happy air craftsman second class, W. Calvin Thistle, my dad. But when all is said and done, I consider my ultimate portrait achievement to be a very recent work which I call Partners. It is of Jay and me and I painted it to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. I see it as an enduring symbol of our relationship and the great life we share together. It seems I've been motivated to design and build things for most of my adult life. Early examples would be the desk I made in 1966, the year I went to teacher's college. And our first stereo. But in my first year of teaching, the year leading up to our wedding in July of 1968, I had gained access to King Lear's school's wood shop with its pro-level power tools, and I worked hard there designing and building to help furnish our first apartment. This list included a modern kitchen table, a coffee table and ottomans, bookshelves, two wood planters, and a major pedestal desk, which I revised more than once over the years. Later projects included two teak lamps, to which I eventually added white plexiglass shades, a second vertical teak stereo unit, which doubled as a sculpture stand, teak stereo speakers, 
and a teak coffee table and end tables. I also created a four bulb plexiglass hanging lamp, which I considered one of my best designs and, by the way, wish I still owned. And in 1977, a mahogany veneer wall unit, which we still use today. Much more recently, in my own home workshop, I built another mahogany wall unit with built-in stained glass lighting. A new mahogany corner coffee table. And an end table out of a maple butcher block top which I rescued from my mother's discarded dishwasher. Obviously, over the years, I have experienced a great deal of pleasure and satisfaction as a designer and builder of useful and modern furnishings, which have meshed well with our contemporary taste. And what's more, I have not been too hard on our pocketbook either. Since moving to the beach in the late fall of 1999, my art life has taken on a more relaxed, less frenetic feel. And although I am producing less, I'm still very satisfied with my output. Early in the new millennium, I took on a couple of series themed on our new surroundings. However, my first painting of 2000 was a commemorative portrait of Pierre Elliott Trudeau called Esprit, which I began almost the day after his death. This I followed with a brief acrylic landscape series. I then set out on a more ambitious series, which I still may continue, called Beach Dreams, beginning with my painting, Red Sunglasses. These images were acrylic on board and were among my largest paintings at 48 by 32 inches each. My most recent decade of art production is lesser in quantity than previous periods, but I feel undoubtedly equal or greater in quality. In 2003, I succumbed to the casual thought that it might be fun to create some stained glass images. I think I had been drawn to this medium due to the fact glass is a bit like watercolor. It relies on its transparency for its glowing color. So far, I have created four projects for our home.
children. often been asked if I have a favorite painting and I always answer usually the one I'm currently working on. However, now that I have organized digital images of my work chronologically for this film, I'm able to more easily scan my output and pick out a few of which I am particularly proud. Let me say finally, I accept that my art is generally narrative in character and for the most part easily accessible. Hidden meaning or psychological mystery are noticeably absent from most of it. I do hope, however, that what I produce reaches its audience, at least in part, on an emotional level because I have spent my art life reacting in various ways to my own often intense emotional response to the visual world around me. It's almost that simple. I am not what most would call a great artist. I define myself in this uncomplicated way. I am a technically competent artist with a relatively short attention span seeking mastery over media and producing works which are hopefully worthy of the time and effort expended on their creation. Art has certainly been one of the major driving forces in my life so far. Thank you.